happy Memorial Day. Glad to have you all with me. Uh, I wasn't sure how many people are going to show up given it's uh, you know, a holiday and I assume everyone's been uh, maybe on vacation or whatever else, uh, but glad to have you all here with me. You know, I, I wanted to give some of my thoughts on Memorial Day patriotism and kind of where we're at as a country. And of course, we're going to questions. If you have questions, leave them in the chat. We'll get to them. We talk about some other things as well, like the debt ceiling, if you want to talk about it. But, you know, going back to Memorial Day, you know, I, I feel like patriotism in the United States is dying. And I feel it's dying both on the right and the left. And I think this is a very unhealthy thing for a country because patriotism is what what holds up generationally the idea uh, that represents what a nation is. You can only go a couple generations without that before basically you have a restructuring of a nation. And I mean, I know some people maybe think maybe that's where America needs to go. And I, I believe there are people on the right and left who do believe that, in fact. It may, maybe it would be a good thing. But my concern is that what America represents and has represented for the entire world was, was not something the world typically had through most of history. If you look at the, the, you know, the annals of history, typically the law, this, the law of the world in which we live was that the strong ruled by force. And that was always how it was, no matter where you were in the world, no matter which empire you lived under, conquering, conquering by force, ruling by force, uh, the strong conquering the weak, that was always the nature of this world. And the only anomaly we've had, the little blip in the very long line of history was, you know, through the United States, essentially. I mean, you could argue even the Roman Empire achieved relative peace. You could argue that some empires achieved relative peace, but they did it through constant war and, also, and often very extreme brutality. Um, you can even look, for example, at the, you know, the former government of Mexico. Was it the, the Aztecs or the Incas? I can't remember which one it was. It was the Aztecs. And where, of course, you know, they were known for mass human sacrifice. And the way that, the way that worked, actually, and I, I, know this from, I know this from reading books written in the 1800s, you know, about this history. Uh, the way that worked typically was that the government there would go out and they would massacre the smaller tribes on a regular basis. And, you know, you might think, oh, they did it because they needed slaves. No, they did it because they wanted human sacrifice. Uh, because basically, anytime you had a coronation for a new official, anytime there was a coronation for a new leader, they believed that the amount of human sacrifice is what would lay the foundation for that new system, that there had to be mass bloodshed. And so they would oftentimes just dominate and slaughter and horribly kill a lot of these smaller, uh, smaller tribes and such. Uh, which is actually funny enough why when the conquistadors, the Spanish conquistadors arrived in Mexico, and remember, you know, the Spaniards were sent from Spain as a crusade. The taking of, Amer the, taking of the Americas was a Spanish crusade. Uh, the idea was to humanize and Christianize the New World. That was, that, was, that was the exact phrase they had, to humanize and Christianize the New World, sent by the Pope himself. And you had a small number of Spanish conquistadors, like I think it was like 300 men, it was not a lot, uh, who were able to unite the smaller tribes who did you know, engage in an overthrow of the Mexican government at the time and formed, even before the United States, actually very strong empires throughout most of Latin America. The United States, or what is now the United States, was the last to be taken. It was very, for some reason, it was very hard for them to ever achieve it. Uh, the first colony in America was actually a uh, it was a French colony in Florida, in fact. And they built a functioning colony in Florida, and the Spaniards actually rolled in, killed everybody, men, women, and children, burned it, and that was the end of it. Then took it over, well, didn't burn it, they took it over. Then the French, out of spite, rolled back in, killed everybody there, and then abandoned it. And that was, you know, they had various attempts to establish colonies. People talk about Jamestown as being, you know, the original colony. There's a reason why we recognize the pilgrims and not the people of Jamestown as being, you know, essentially the first people to begin the United States. Why is that? Jamestown did not represent America. Jamestown was where you had 1619 Project and all that stuff. Jamestown was a failed state. 
Jamestown maintained the same type of contract that he had under the Plymouth Plantation, uh, which was the idea of essentially shared redistribution of food and all that stuff. It was failing. Uh, Jamestown did, in fact, have slaves, although you could argue they were brought by accident. It was, it was a, a ship that captured another ship that had slaves on it. They arrived in the Americas of these, these freed slaves, actually, uh, who then arrived there. And actually, it was one of those slave, one of those former slaves who you know, really did not become a slave when he was here, uh, who actually fought for his right to own slaves. It was actually brought here by one of the black. Slavery was introduced by one of the black slaves because uh, he sued to have the right to own slaves uh, because the, the white settlers didn't want it. Jamestown actually maintained, it was, again, Jamestown after King James. It was a British colony. It was not representative of the pilgrims and so on, who were a very different type. They maintained the same type of contract the Plymouth, the Plymouth Plantation initially had, which was really like a type of socialist redistribution type contract, which only when the Plymouth Plantation got rid of that did they succeed. And they were also massacred, brutally massacred, by one of the Native American tribes very shortly after all of that. Um, in fact, yeah, that, that was King Philip's war. King Philip, one of the Native Americans, brutally massacred Jamestown, killed all of them, or just about all of them. Like, I mean, it was a very brutal war. And the reason King Philip did that, I, I believe it was his father, they had made peace with the Indians. And, uh, you know, basically they were mad because, of course, the settlers coming to America were converting a lot of the Native Americans to Christianity. King Philip saw that as an assault on their culture. And so he not only killed all the, Ameri all the, all the European settlers he could, but he also killed, massacred all the Indian Christians. He massacred all of them. Uh, and that's the history of Jamestown. Plymouth and the Plymouth Plantation... And you can still read you can still read the old books in this. The journals are still. In fact, I have I have copies of them. In fact, they're fantastic, and I, I recommend reading them. And I, I think the world would be a better place if if more Americans did read them. The Plymouth Plantation was was the root of America, and we recognize it as such, and always have recognized it as such for a key reason. It was the success story that began the full settlements across the United States. It was people who were fleeing religious persecution, right? It was Protestants. It was people who were brutally persecuted in Europe when you had, of course, the Spanish Inquisition and laws restricting you know, heresy and so on. If you read the old Christian Bibles at that time, the Protestant Bibles, because the printing press basically gave the religion back to the people. Uh, it was no longer that you had to listen to you know, an agent of the state, essentially, uh, interpreting your religion for you, you can go and study it yourself, and you can come to your own conclusions, and self-study, and self-understanding, and self-responsibility became the creed of a new people, established by, really, this new, this new view of morality. Those individuals fled, uh, of course, the Netherlands, right? And of, of course, came to the United States as the pilgrims. They, it was a very narrow success, them coming here. They built a colony. They purchased that land from the Indians. They bought it. The, the, in fact, the, the documents of them buying it still exist. And oftentimes they would buy it multiple times because they'd buy it from one Indian you know, tribe. And they'd be like, okay, thank you. Then another Indian tribe would come in and they'd be like, hey, you have to pay us because they stole it from us. And then they'd pay them too. And then the next tribe would come in and say, no, you have to pay us because they stole it from us. And then they stole it from them. And they'd have to buy it again. And that happened a lot in America. They would buy the land from the Indians. The contracts of the purchases still exist. And the Indians would make them pay multiple times regardless, you know. But basically, there was, a, there was a very, where the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock, there was a very dangerous tribe there that would have killed all of them. They would have massacred them. Uh, but through an act of God, or whatever you want to call it, um, there was an outbreak of some weird disease there, and it killed everyone before the, before the pilgrims arrived. And there was one remaining individual... <laughs> who was who was Squanto? Going lo and behold, uh, who had been, of course, taken to the Americas, learned to speak English, and so these settlers arrived there, 
And there's a single Indian guy there who was from that former tribe that had died, right? He came back and everyone was dead already. And like they, they arrived there and there's this Indian guy who speaks perfect English, you know? <laughs> but of course, it was from that that basically they had the same type of contract that the other settlements have had that were failing. And what they were was redistribution programs. Everything went into a shared pool. They were like communist communes. If you farmed, your fa the, the fruits of your labor went into a shared pool and everybody could take from it. And because nobody was responsible for themselves, some people worked harder and some people did not work very hard. And the people who worked very hard stopped seeing a reason to work hard because the guy who didn't work hard could come and take whatever he wanted. There was no, there was no individual, you know, there was no element of self-responsibility that maintained a strong work ethic. People were not responsible to themselves and they certainly were not responsible to their neighbors. And that's the nature of socialism. That's why it usually, well, one of the many reasons why it usually fails. And it was failing. They were dying. They were starving. And they ended up getting rid of that um, social, that contract and made it so that everybody would be able to keep what they had. And if you didn't take care of yourself, that was your own dang business. And that led to very deep prosperity. And that prosperity was what allowed, essentially, a successful colony to finally be established in the Americas. And unlike the Spaniard colonies and the French colonies and even the British colonies to an extent, the, the, you know, the Plymouth Plantation, the Pilgrims, they maintained pretty good relationships with the Indians. They, they did not have the strength to fight them. They were not warriors. They were, they were religious. They were more religious refugees. And, of course, you know, the nature of their settlement did establish a very harmonious settlement, which, again, began spreading. And essentially, that's how the whole thing started. That is why we recognize, you know, Plymouth Rock and the Pilgrims as the founders of America, not Jamestown, not the first, first you know, French or Spanish colony in Florida. In fact, not Mexico, which was, was the Spaniards, and not Canada, which was the French and then later the British. We don't recognize those as being the original colonies, although colonies existed there prior to those that are now, that are now of what we call the United States. That's why we recognize it. And unfortunately, this history is just almost totally forgotten. But the American idea... What, you know, what it, was, it was explained to me one time, actually funny enough, by an old cowboy poet. Um, I was talking, I, I, years ago, I was doing a story about patriotism. I think it must have been, it might, actually, it might have been from Memorial Day, in fact. What is patriotism? Why is patriotism necessary? He is an old Vietnam veteran. And he told me, well, you know, I'm not much, this was before Trump and all that stuff. He says, well, you know, I'm honestly not much of a patriot. He goes, you know, I, I see the uh, I see the Republicans and the Democrats, and the way he said it, he says, you know, there are two bir two wings of the same bird of prey. He's an old cowboy poet, right? Two wings on the same bird of prey, and he goes, I don't really believe either of them has my best interest in mind. This is him, right, saying this. But he goes, but you know, patriotism is something that goes beyond that, and patriotism is really a love for your neighbor. It's a love for the people of your culture and a love for the people who share the same basic, you know, view of what a country is as you do. It's, it's the love for the people of a country. That's what patriotism is. Now, I know people have been talking, funny enough, since prior to World War I about this whole idea of a, a brotherhood of man. The, we call it globalism now, right? We call it globalism now. And the idea that, well, if you can get rid of the things that divide us, national identity, racial identity, maybe even gender identity, well, all the, all the things that would differentiate us from one another would be eliminated, and therefore everybody would have a single identity or maybe just a fluid identity, and we'd have nothing to fight over. What, you know, kumbaya, you know, let's all, let's all stand in a circle and smoke our peace pipes, you know. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what they think it's going to be like. And we're finding the opposite. When you destroy the elements of unity, you do not get unity. You get disunity. When you destroy common identity, 
you do not have this kumbaya, you know, peace pipe session. No, you have people who don't have, who don't have the glue to hold a society together, who don't have the, the unifying ideas and the unifying beliefs that create social harmony. Once you destroy those things, you destroy society. Once you destroy those things, you destroy the moral foundation that allows for harmonious interaction between people. That's the, no matter where you go, and I know people have their own beliefs, religion serves that purpose. Religion is the glue that allows for you know, harmonious interaction of individuals. It's what maintains a moral standard. You destroy that. You don't get some new you know, fluid, reason-based morality. No, you end up with people who don't see a, a, don't see consequence of wrongdoing and you could argue it's not everybody give or take you're going to always have you're always going to have good people who even through just moral reason or maybe human conscience uh, can recognize an idea of right and wrong but typically those individuals are going to be crushed by the people who are not like that and so it is the idea of a nation and the idea of common, you know, I don't want to call it common law because it has other meanings now, but, but, but a general idea of law and morality that holds a society together. And if you destroy that, if you lose that, um, you know, that, that's when a nation dies. And so I would urge you all, in my, my personal opinion, and this is just me saying it, remember that patriotism is not something represented by politics. Patriotism is not something controlled by one party or another or one administration or another. It should be something that is beneath the water, that maintains itself regardless of what's on the surface. And it is something that's much deeper than just that. It's, it's genuinely a love for the people of your country. And I mean, I know Crossroads, a lot of people in different parts of the world watch it. I'm not just saying this as an American. I hope my Korean friends love their culture and i respect you for that i hope my indian friends love their culture and i respect you for that i hope my canadian friends and their harsh arctic tundra and you know looking across the that vast expanse from the the national igloo love their culture and love who they are and you know <laughs> I'm, I'm joking with you all i'm joking with you all. <laughs> i have canadian friends we like we like to poke fun at each other <laughs> But, um, you know, genuinely, it, it is not that one person or another loving their people and loving their country and loving who they are creates disharmony. It's that we can have our own identities and within, within national identity and within different cultures and maintain that and still be able to appreciate others who are not of the same culture or mindset as we are. There, there are differences between us, and those differences are what ironically create actual diversity. And so, my personal thoughts, folks, on why this matters so much, why patriotism matters. Uh, let's uh, we'll jump into some questions, but let's go over to Epoch TV for that. So those of you on YouTube, come join us on Epoch TV. Not only will you get to watch the rest of the episode, but you can also, as well, help this show keep going, because you might notice we don't have ads on YouTube. Um, I would like to have ads on YouTube, but we currently don't last I checked. Uh, so come join us on Epoch TV. Help this show keep keep going. Uh, help us keep uh, Epoch TV going as well. And we have great content there. So I'll see you on Epoch TV and we'll go into questions. <laughs> 